good morning. I'm Dino Dave, and this is The Creation Investigation, the truth about dinosaurs, the truth about dinosaurs. This presentation, more than any others, involves my personal area of research. I love everything science, but the dinosaurs are my special area of fascination. And sometimes people wonder, they, they, they'd like to know, what happened to you? How did you turn from being an ordinary boy into Dino Dave? Uh, what, what went on? And, and uh, I always loved dinosaurs as a kid, but then as a young man, I had the opportunity, our class went to the Boston Museum of Science. And I don't know if it's still true today, but at the time they had this triceratops skeleton on display. And I just still to this day remember being awed by this incredible, this is my first chance to see a full dinosaur skeleton. And I'm just in wonder of this thing as a young man. And then I looked down at the placard and it says, this dinosaur lived 65 million years ago. And I remember being distressed by the fact that here's the science. This is the skeleton. This is the dinosaur. That's the actual bones. And then here, right alongside of it, is somebody's speculation about origins. And, and I, in my opinion, that shouldn't be there. That, you know, this should be about the science, not somebody's opinions about origins. And I actually got into a discussion, an argument, with somebody there at the Boston Museum of Science. And so I like to credit the Boston Museum of Science with starting me on this trajectory to being involved in the origins debate and being Dino Dave. I'm the president of Genesis Park, and we have a website, genesispark.com, and our tagline is this, Dinosaurs, Living Evidence of a Powerful Creator. And I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll see why we like to say that dinosaurs are living evidence of a powerful creator. You know, there have been a lot of revolutions, continuing changes in the scientists' ideas about the dinosaurs. Uh, they certainly haven't got them all figured out. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea, here's some uh, magazine headlines. This is going all the way back to 1953. Believe it or not, before I was born... And Life Magazine says, it's true, dinosaurs grew so vast and so ponderous, they expanded into decadence and doom. Basically, they got so fat, they went extinct. Oh, that was 1953. Uh, here is 1995. Newsweek, rethinking the riddle of the dinosaurs. Okay, we have to rethink it, but that didn't quite get it right, because here's Life Magazine, I'm sorry, Time Magazine. The truth about dinosaurs, surprise, just about everything you believe is wrong. Well, unfortunately, just about everything in that magazine article was wrong, too. Uh, this is a more recent one. This is National Geographic, and they say, after two centuries of paleontological harvest, the evidence seems stranger than any fable and continues to get stranger. And part of the problem is they're starting in the wrong place. You see, when we start with God's inspired word, it sets us in the right course. It allows us to be able to put things in perspective. Why? Because that's absolute truth. Science is our best estimate to understand the natural world, and it's wonderful, and I love it, and I believe it's even commanded by God, but God's Word is revealed truth. You can take it to the bank. You can build your life upon it. Here's our outline for this session. I want to talk about why we say dinosaurs are living evidence of a powerful creator. I want to give some evidence of dinosaurs coexisting with man, which is my personal area of research. We'll talk about dinosaurs in the Bible, dinosaurs in history, and dinosaur fossil analysis. And finally, hopefully at the end, we'll have a little bit of time to have some fun and talk about dinosaur hunting expeditions. So let's talk about this. Why do I like to say dinosaurs are living evidence of a powerful creator? If you've got your Bible, I'd invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 40, the book of Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28, the prophet is asking an incredulous question. And he's really, he's asking about the point of the cosmos, the message of the cosmos. We could call it the cosmic message. And he says this, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. So the prophet is saying, how can you not know this? How can you not, just by looking at the world around about you, understand some basic things about God, about the creator, the designer of this universe? Now, take a look at that verse and see if you can maybe point out what are three things about the creator that the prophet wants us to learn just from looking at his creation? Can somebody pick one out there for me? 
He's everlasting. Very good. Uh, Ma'am, he, he is everlasting. And that is this idea that God is eternal. And when we look at the space-mass-time continuum, whoever made this must himself exist outside of time. I mean, how can you make time if you're not outside of time, right? So we would call that God's eternality. He's everlasting. Somebody else, what else can we see there about the Creator? Yes. So yes, he is a creator, but I'm looking for three characteristics. Yes. His understanding, right. There's no searching his understanding. We have a big theological word for that. We say he is omniscient. And when you look at the complexity in the genome, we look at the information system that's got packed into tiny little microscopic creatures, we say, wow, incredible intelligence on display right in our microscopes. But there's one other thing. Do you see it there? He never tires. He's omnipotent. He has this unbelievable strength. Hey, the strongest man in the world. You ever see these guys, they're pulling trucks, you know, they get these ropes attached, they're pulling an 18-wheeler. The strongest man in the world is going to get tired. He's going to wear down. And God never gets tired. He never wears down. And so the prophet is saying, how can you not know, just from looking at the world around you, God's greatness, his vastness in his, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his eternality. Just look at the stars, the power of Almighty God. Well, what part did dinosaurs as part of God's creation play in this cosmic message? An impressive creature tells about our great creator. And certainly these huge dinosaurs, some of the largest things you know ever to walk on planet Earth, tell about our great creator. Like all biology, dinosaurs are very complex. Yeah, there's a lot of puzzles, a lot of things we can't even figure out about it. And that complexity shows God's uh, power and also God's intelligence, and that helps show us the greatness of our Creator. I believe some of these creatures have existed till recent times, perhaps even still some alive today, and the evidence shows that these creatures are smaller than in the distant past. Evidence of de-evolution. We'll talk more about this in our next session. But evidence that things were created good and are degenerating. They're going downhill. So everything in the fossil record is bigger, including the dinosaurian creatures. And then number five, no plausible naturalistic origin. That is, the evolutionists can't even agree where the dinosaurs came from. Oh, you get different stories and different folks have some different hypotheses and guesses but they can't even agree on where the dinosaurs came from. Here is a quote. This is uh, the N British Natural History Museum's book on dinosaurs, 2019. Dinosaurs are one of the most successful groups of animals to have roamed the planet, from small creatures just a few feet long to some of the largest animals that have ever walked Earth. But despite their long evolutionary history, the origin of dinosaurs remained shrouded in mystery. When they first appeared, they were already recognizably dinosaurs. Just poof. They pop into existence. No, hey, this clearly came from that. No clear ancestors of some other kind of animal. Almost like they were created. Maybe because they were created. But that doesn't keep the evolutionists from telling stories about the dinosaurs and using the dinosaurs to sell evolution. Here's a quote from Sean Carroll, his book, Endless Forms Most Beautiful. He says, dinosaurs are the poster children of evolution. They inspire the vast majority of those who touch them. Unfortunately, I have to agree with Sean Carroll. The evolutionists have been very successful at co-opting the dinosaurs. Much like my experience at the uh, Boston Museum of uh, history, uh, Boston Museum there, uh, you go into any museum of natural history and you're going to see dinosaur displays millions of years before man evolved. They're selling evolution. One of the things you quite often see is this. Dinosaurs evolved into birds. Don't you know, Dino Dave, that when you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, you're eating a dinosaur? Really? Well, these are all over the displays. It's through the books of dinosaurs. You see this type of thing. Um, but here's what they don't tell you in the museums and in the books. Paleontologists have found 432 mammal species in the dinosaur layers, almost as many as the number of dinosaur species, also many modern bird species. Look at this. Parrots, owls, penguins, ducks, loons, albatross, cormorants, sandpipers, and avocets have all been found buried in the exact same rock layer as the popular dinosaurs. So put your thinking caps on for a quick minute here. If a dinosaur is starting on this trajectory over millions and millions of years towards becoming a bird, 
how do you have fully formed modern bird species buried right alongside the dinosaurs? I mean, we're not even talking about proto-birds. We're talking about recognizable ducks, loons, albatross, species we recognize that we see out there today. So the story completely falls apart. Well, how about this question? What killed the dinosaurs? They once roamed all over planet Earth. We have dinosaurs, fossils in Antarctica, all the way up to Alaska, literally every continent on planet Earth. What happened? Some people are saying the flood. Okay, I agree. Most of these fossils, this T-Rex tooth and this uh, coprolite fossilized dino doo-doo, I mean, these, these fossils are made during the flood. But we got crocodilians buried in those same rock layers, and yet we have crocodiles, alligators roaming around the earth today. How come we don't have dinosaurs in our backyards? How did it go from being this kind of swamp-like paradise for reptiles to being so difficult that they had to go extinct? Well, how about this? What do the paleontologists, what do the evolutionists say happened? A meteor strike, right? That's the most common theory. Everybody's familiar with it. You know, Dino Dave, there was this huge meteor, bam, it smashed down maybe into the Yucatan Peninsula or somewhere, and fiery inferno, and all the dinosaurs went extinct. But the theory's got major problems. Uh, that story is probably the most popular, but it's certainly not the only one. There are literally dozens of ideas as to why the dinosaurs went extinct, and they all have problems, and none of them have a majority of paleontologists behind them. Uh, for example, with this one, okay, so you're going to burn up all the dinosaurs. Well, what about the thin-skinned lizards? How come they survived? Again, crocodilians, very similar physiology to the dinosaurs. How about some of the large lizards like Komodo dragons, monitor lizards? How can we still have them today? You see, it doesn't make sense. It just really doesn't uh, fit together. So uh, one of the theories is oxygen. Well, don't you know, Dino Day, the oxygen change, and of course, uh, Triceratops runs out of oxygen tank, and that's the end of him, right? How about this one? Do you think they missed the boat? You think they got the date wrong and, oh, no, we, we missed it. We weren't on the boat. No, God was in charge of this, and we know that he brought two of each kind to Noah. We know the dinosaurs were on the ark. So what would we say as creationists killed off the dinosaurs? Well, probably a big factor was the post-flood environmental changes. After the flood, in the centuries after the flood, a lot of catastrophe still going on, um, the earth reeling from this huge, we'll talk about it a little bit more in our upcoming sessions, uh, reeling from this huge catastrophe, and there would have been an ice age. And large reptiles, of course, struggle, you know, uh, particularly cold-blooded reptiles struggle in that kind of an environment, and so that would have contributed to some of them going extinct. But I believe some did survive till more recent times, and people call them dragons. We have stories of dragons in every major culture. The word dinosaur wasn't coined until 1841, first used in print in 1842 by Richard Owen. And before that, even the naturalists and scientists in Europe, they digging up the bones, they called them dragon bones. And so we have these reports of dragons. So people need to be brought into the equation, and I believe people hunted these great reptiles because they were a threat or maybe killed them for food or medicine or maybe the desire to be a hero, to rescue the young maiden. Uh, and so I think perhaps maybe even some have saw, survived till fairly recent times. Okay, well, let's jump into some of the evidence that dinosaurs have coexisted with man. Let's talk about dinosaurs in the Bible. When I go into various forums, I go into public schools, I go into public colleges, and I talk about dinosaurs, I get a lot of strange looks. People say, well, no, wait a minute, Dino Dave, there's no way. I mean, how could people even live alongside dinosaurs? By the way, don't you know that National Geographic has clearly said no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur? Well, think about that statement for just a minute. Put on your biblical hats. Is that statement true? We know absolutely 100% biblically that statement is not true. Who do we know for sure saw living dinosaurs? Adam and Eve, right? Adam names every one of the animals. Somebody said Noah. Noah, two of every kind on the ark, okay? So we absolutely know for sure at least Adam and Noah saw living dinosaurian creatures. So we're not going to use National Geographic as our touch point for truth here. We're going to let the Bible explain the dinosaurs. And all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 25, the Bible says, God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, everything creeps upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. This would include the dinosaurian creatures. 
This is the sixth day of creation, the same day that God makes man. So literally from the day that God makes man, men and dinosaurs coexist on planet Earth. I want to talk about the book of Job for a minute. Give you a little bit of background on this, what we consider probably the oldest book in the Bible. Of course, Genesis talks about the beginning, but it was written by Moses. Moses, of course, being one of the sons of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Eventually, you end up there in Egypt, and eventually Moses comes along at the time of, uh, of the Exodus. He uh, writes the book of Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But Job is somewhere between Noah and Abraham, older than Moses. And he writes this book, probably the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job. And the book starts with tragedy in Job's life. Now, you may have had a bad day. And maybe, you know, just the weather and your hair just wouldn't turn out today. Or maybe you just, your breakfast, it was awful and it's just a bad start. Maybe your coffee machine broke. Um, you've probably never had as bad a day as Job had. I don't know for sure. I mean, people have some pretty serious crises still today. But in one day, Job literally lost it all. Job lost it all. His kids were killed. All his wealth was taken away. He lost everything. All his wealth was destroyed. Uh, even all his cars, I mean his camels, uh, you know, they all got wiped out. And then to make matters worse, God allows Satan to come in and, and touch Job, and he has boils all over his body from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. My sister and brother-in-law are missionaries in Africa, and their son got one boil on his head, and they were worried it was close to his brain, and they had to medevac him to, uh, to South Africa for, for treatment. But Job had these boils all over his body, and he was miserable. And in the midst of this tragedy, his quote-unquote, friends come to comfort him. And instead of comforting him, they say, now, Job, you must have been a really bad guy. We didn't know it, but you must have been a skunk because all these bad things happened to you. <sighs> That's his friends. And so Job gets frustrated, and he begins to question, God, what's going on in my life? You ever wonder about that? God, why did you give me this boss at work? I can hardly stand my job anymore. It's awful. God, what's happened in my marriage? This is just not what I expected, and things are just bad. God, my family, my, my sister, I can hardly stand my brother and my sister. Lord, this teacher at school. Oh, God, what are you doing in my life? Lord, this physical infirmity, this difficulty, this sickness, this financial situation. God, what's going on? You ever feel that way? Job says, I wish God would just show up. In Job chapter 13, verse 3, he says, Surely I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God. God, could you just sit there and I'll sit here. Let's just talk. What's going on? Now, God's probably not going to show up for you if you have that kind of question. But God did show up for Job, and it's recorded, and it's helpful for us to see what happens next. Because God does show up, and he does answer Job's question, but he answers it in a very strange way. That is, he never specifically addresses Job's question, but he turns around and he begins to ask Job questions. Starting there in Job chapter 38, about 70 questions go up and add them up, and they're questions that Job has no answer to. Questions that are like beyond him, like, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Have you ever seen the mountain goats give birth? And, and God asks this question, hey, Job, have you entered into the springs of the sea? Well, look, we didn't even know there were springs at the bottom of the deepest ocean basins until we had submersibles that could take that kind of pressure. In 1973, they went down and they discovered whole ecosystems way down in the complete darkness at the bottom of the ocean, these spewing uh, ocean fountains and blind fish and squid and, and things kind of around there and shrimp. And, and Job didn't know that existed. Why is God doing this? Why is God asking these questions of Job? I believe God's making a point to Job. He's saying, Job, I'm God. I got this. You see, sometimes we think our problem is all these issues in our life. That's not our problem. Follow me on this. Our problem is our view of Almighty God. You see, when we got a big view of God, 
We understand he's omniscient. He knows what's going on. He's omnipotent. He's got all power. He can change anything he wants. He's eternal. He's not going anywhere. I can give him this. He's got this. I don't have to figure this out. He's got it. I can just trust him with my life. When we got a big view of God, we got really small problems. But when we got a small view of God, we got huge problems because this is on us. We got to figure this out. And this is bad. Our problem is our view of Almighty God. That's the message of the book of Job. And when you understand that, all of a sudden it makes sense when in Job chapter 40, God says, I want to talk about a creature called Behemoth. Well, what's Behemoth? We don't know 100% for sure, uh, but we do know some things about it. In Job chapter 40, verse 15, it says, He eats grass like an ox. Well, that means he's herbivorous. Could Behemoth be a tiger? No, carnivorous. How about, could behemoth be a T-Rex? No, carnivorous, right? And so we need an herbivorous creature. Well, then it says in verse 16, his force is in the navel of his belly. He's got this big, strong belly. Because of that verse, some commentators suggest that behemoth is an elephant. And elephants do have a big belly. Other commentators suggest, well, maybe it's a hippopotamus. Hippopotamus have really big bellies. It does talk about him living in the swamps and in the waters there. I would suggest to you that we not rule out my friends, the sauropod dinosaurs, because these guys also had really big bellies. But then it says this in verse 17. It says, he moves his tail like a cedar tree. Now, the cedar trees were the tallest, the biggest trees in the Middle East. They used them for masts on boats. They used them to construct the temple. This was going to be like a major characteristic of this creature was he had this huge tail. Well, what about our friend the elephant? Here's an elephant. Now, Mr. Elephant, can you turn around and show what you got for a tail there? Oh, my. Now, that is not a tail like a cedar tree. How about our buddy the hippo? Well, here's the hippo. Mr. Hippo, turn around show us your tail. Oops. Definitely not a tail like a cedar tree. Compare that to our friend, the dinosaur, the sauropod dinosaur, an absolutely major feature of these large sauropods were their huge tails. So I think the tail of the tails definitely goes to the sauropod. I think what kind of really settles it in my mind is verse 19. It says this, he is the chief of the ways of God. He's the biggest thing that God made to roam around this earth. And so God shows Remember, he's showing his greatness and his power to Job. He's wowing Job. He shows him this creature and says, look at Behemoth. Behemoth probably was something like a sauropod dinosaur. These creatures weigh up to 100 tons, equivalent of 14 school buses. Huge. And then God shifts gears from the biggest thing he made to the fiercest thing he made. In Job chapter 41, God says this, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Now, God has a little bit of a sense of humor because he's talking about the fiercest thing he made. He says, hey, Job, would you like to go fishing and catch a Leviathan? Do we have any fishermen or fisher ladies in here? How would you like to be fishing in the boat and you all of a sudden swing it out there and you just kind of set it and you're waiting and all of a sudden the bobber goes down and boop, you pull it up and you've got a Mosasaurus. Oops. Do you want to bring him in the boat with you? Probably not. And God is a little bit facetious when he says, hey, you want to bring him home to your girls and play with him? No. In fact, God says in verse 10, none is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? My friends, this is where the whole book of Job is going right here. God is saying, you would be wild with behemoth. You would be scared of Leviathan. Guess what? I made them. You wouldn't want to come around a corner on a dark night and run into a dinosaur, but you're going to stand before me. That should be a very sobering thought for all of us. Well, the other thing the Bible says about this Leviathan is that it breathes fire. You might say, well, Dino Dave, you really believe in fire-breathing dragons? I do. Mostly because the Bible says so. The Bible says, out of his mouth goes a flame of fire. His his breath kindles coals of fire. Sparks come out. So, well, how is that possible? How can something breathe fire and not be burned up? Well, we have some interesting evidence that this actually 
could be the case with dragons. We have historical evidence. That is, many cultures, even uh, cultures that didn't interact, talk about fire-breathing dragons. We also have some biological evidence that this could exist in the form of a little beetle. How many heard of the bombardier beetle? Okay, a couple people have heard of it. It's a very fascinating beetle. It's uh, got some wonderful capability in that it has these two chambers, one full of hydrogen peroxide, the other has hydroquinone. And when they come together with a catalyst, boom, you get an explosion at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm going to show you a little uh, video clip here. This is a bomber to be able to notice this little squirt gun out back. He can squirt under his legs coming out his front without burning his own legs. He can squirt, of course, straight back. He can also squirt up over his body. And an incredible chemical reaction goes. And you can see the smoke of this coming off. Uh, a, 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 one of these beetles landed on the neck of a boy, and the boy went to slap it, thinking maybe it was, you know, a horsefly or something, and he got a beetle burn. There's a bombardier beetle burn. So this is a pretty serious little explosive fire-breathing, well, not fire-breathing, fire-emitting beetle. And then we have some ideas from paleontology. This is just, uh, you know, kind of a theory, uh, uh, some speculation, a hypothesis, really, uh, that maybe some of these creatures, like this Parasaurolophus, that had this head crest, perhaps they had chemicals stored in the head crest, kind of like the bombardier beetle, and they could uh, press air down through there and squirt out chemicals that would explode like the bombardier beetle, and they could breathe fire. It's just, it's just a hypothesis. Perhaps we're on the wrong trail with it. Perhaps it's a creature that we don't even know what a leviathan is. Uh, on this topic of dinosaurs in the Bible, we have a reptilian flying creature, called the fiery flying serpent, mentioned twice in the book of Isaiah. Very likely uh, some kind of a pterosaur, maybe a pterodactyl type of creature that was still alive at that time. So we do have uh, a number of creatures, dinosaurs, possible dinosaur and creatures in the Bible. But then I want to kind of put the pedal to the metal, go a little bit faster here, and I want to talk about dinosaurs in history. We have a lot of historical accounts. We have a lot of iconography, ancient drawings, carvings, artwork, depicting dinosaurs. I've got quite a number of these in my book. I've got a whole lot more on my website. But I want to just give you a little bit of a taster of it. Here in uh, the Natural Bridges or uh, National Monument there, we have some Indian artwork. Um, and these uh, Anasazi Indians, they are drawing what appears to be a long neck, long-tailed sauropod dinosaur. There's these figurines that are dug up down in Mexico uh, outside the city of Acambaro, uh, something that we believe is pre-classical Chupicara culture, around 800 BC, and these ceramics look very much like sauropod dinosaurs. Very famous, the Ica stones. These come from the southern part of Peru near the Okokahi Desert there. I've been down there multiple times and actually seen some that uh, professional archaeologists have taken directly from the tombs, and uh, they have these uh, stylized long neck, long tail creatures from the Nazca culture, 300 B.C. to 800 A.D. It's long before anybody's digging up dinosaur bones. So how do they know what a dinosaur looks like? Very fascinating. They show these bumps. You see these little rounded tubercules on some of these Ica stones? Well, only more recently have we found fossilized dinosaur skin. Very rare. Mostly you're going to find just bones, but occasionally you find some of the soft body parts. And you see on the dinosaur skin, you see these rounded tubercules. Uh, here's a Nazcan pottery vase, and it shows what appears to be a dinosaur and creature crawling up it. Perhaps that's an attempt to uh, model a dinosaur. We see uh, also, this again, the same uh, region down there, the Mochi burial objects. We see what they call a strombus monster. The archaeologists call it a strombus monster, but it's got all this unique ornamentation around, long neck, long tail creatures on these Mochi stirrup pots, also on some of these fabrics they find in the tombs. And then in Cambodia, there's a temple called Taprum. Taprum, it's part of a larger complex, Angkor Wat, and I've been there and been able to see this beautiful temple. It's kind of overrun with trees in the jungle of the forest, but lots of carvings on the pillars and on the sides of this thing. And you see things like, um, you know, water buffalo, of course, people. You see things like uh, goats and th this type of thing. But what is that in the center? That looks an awful lot like a stegosaurus. You see a creature that has these plates going up along its back and... Uh, has that kind of a long tail coming down, and it seems as if these ancient Khmer people were attempting to draw a stegosaurus. And then we have in Mesopotamia, we have different things. We have these cylinders 
for example, that are used to press into wax to make a seal, and you see these long-necked creatures, long-necked creatures with a lot of musculature, much like our modern reproductions of an Apatosaurus. Here is a slate palette from Harakonpolis in the first Egyptian dynasty, and it shows these long-necked creatures. They're fighting over a sheep, and, uh, but uh, very interesting. Here is these walls of ancient Babylon, today in a museum in Germany, and they are from 600 BC, and they show lions, they show bulls, and they show dragons. You see these scaly dragons with a forked tongue, a long tail, and these just really vicious-looking claws. Here is a vase, an urn, a carrion urn from 530 BC, and you see uh, this Hercules is attacking this sea monster, and it appears very much like a Mosasaurus. It's got the slender body flippers, the thick jaws, large eyes, tail fluke. It looks a lot like a Mosasaurus. Here was a Roman mosaic from 200 to 400 AD. This is back when the Romans ruled the area that's today England. And this mosaic shows what appears to be a plesiosaurus or maybe a tanistrophius, these long-necked, uh, sea-going uh, reptilian creatures like this plesiosaurus here. Uh, so perhaps that's something that they were familiar with in the ocean-faring regions there in, in Britain. And then maybe the most famous mosaic in the world, it's a beautiful mosaic, just south of Rome in the area of Palestrina. And you can go online, you can look at the Palestrina mosaic, and typically they're only going to show you the bottom of the mosaic, which is beautiful. I mean, it's got crocodiles, hippos, and it's got the Egyptians going up and down the Nile River in their boats. But if you follow further up the mosaic, the Nile River goes up into what's desert, and here you have uh, African warriors, and they're fighting against what looks a lot like a dinosaur. And uh, they write there in old Greek, block Greek, crocodilio pardalis or crocodile leopard. They didn't know what to call it. They called it a crocodile leopard. It runs fast like a leopard, but it's reptilian like a crocodile. Very interesting. Uh, here we see the Chinese civilization. And the Chinese civilization, of course, you have the 12 signs of the zodiac, and you're something depending on what year you're born. Maybe you're a rabbit or maybe you're a horse. Or, but all these are obviously known animals still alive today. Well, what about the dragon? Why would they pick a mythical animal and stick it in there with all these real animals? Well, I don't believe it was mythical. I believe the Chinese were familiar with dragons. And in fact, 1611, the Chinese emperor appointed the post of royal dragon feeder. Historical accounts tell of the Chinese families raising dragons, using their blood for medicines, highly prizing their eggs. They got lots of recipes for using dragon bones or ground up dragon eggs. Uh, the Emperor Yu, the Great, used dragons to pull his chariot. Kind of a, a nice little novelty. Uh, this interpretation of dinosaurs as dragons goes back more than 2,000 years in Chinese culture. They were regarded as sacred and as a symbol of power. Here's a couple of Chinese artifacts. Uh, this is one here. You notice one a, has a beak and it has the tridactyl, almost bird-like feet, but then it has this long tail and this scales all over its body, much like an oviraptor. Here's a Chinese jade statue from the Shang Dynasty. Notice the scale-like patterns all over it, and it's got a, a very similar build to a Saurolophus dinosaur. So good evidence that the Chinese were familiar with dinosaurian creatures. Then we go to medieval Europe, and lots of stories of dragons in medieval Europe. This picture is a man, Ulysses Aldrovandus. Now, you need to understand that Ulysses Aldrovandus is highly respected as a uh, father of natural history. He worked at the first university in the world there in Bologna, Italy. He established the world's first museum. He collected things like iguanas and monitor lizards, had them stuffed and put in his museum. I've been to Aldrovandus' museum. I went there and I asked him, I said, hey, uh, I see a lot of his mounts still here. Where's the dragon mount? Oh, they said we lost that. That got lost over the years. But he wrote a book, The Natural History of Serpents and Dragons, and he very carefully in detail recorded, you know, the exact day of the year. And he talked about Batista, who encountered this dragon on the road. His oxen stopped, and they wouldn't move forward. And he went forward to see what the problem is. And here's a dragon. He hits it with his staff. He kills a dragon, gives it to Aldrovandus, who stuffs it and puts it in his museum. Credible report of a dragon encounter in Europe. Beowulf. Story of Beowulf, very ancient story, uh, fought dragons. In fact, he was killed fighting a winged dragon in 583 A.D. Uh, many reports from around Europe of St. George slaying the dragon, uh, in some cases somewhat exaggerated, but perhaps there's some uh, you know, legitimate or origin of the story. This is going way back, 1450 A.D., 
but some of these look very much like known types of dinosaurs. A lot of the castles, especially in France, here's Chateau de Chambord, and you can see dragons. Like, look at this right there. You see that dragon there? Uh, here's another one. And notice they're, they're walking erect. They're not like a lizard or a crocodile where their legs are splayed out. They look very much like a dinosaurian creature. In fact, this one here, let me pull the background away from it, looks quite a bit like a Platyosaurus or maybe a Baryonyx. We have Baryonyx skeletons, you know, all around Europe. And, and maybe some survived and people knew about them and they drew these depictions of them. Um, they are definitely not a lizard or a salamander or an amphibian. They're definitely a walking very erect. Notice what's coming out of his mouth. You know, he might just be steam on a hot day, but it looks an awful like he's breathing fire, right? Here is a tapestry, a fabric, and you see this dragon. It looks a lot like Hogwartsia, this dragon that was featured on National Geographic cover that we saw earlier in our presentation. But look what's over in the bushes here is a little baby. Isn't that so cute? Wouldn't you like to have that for your pet? It's going to grow up to be big, though, you know, and maybe just breathe fire. So you might not want that in your house. Here's another tapestry. Notice you have a lion, and the lion is fighting what looks to be a pterosaur. You see the bat-like wings there. You see uh, the teeth and the jaw. You see a bit of a head crest. You see the long tail there. And so this is, uh, again, from France, one of these chateaus, a beautiful pterosaur tapestry. I took this picture in Italy. This is a church of the San Miniato in Florence, uh, constructed in the 11th century. And there on the, on the ceiling was this amazing uh, depiction of a pterosaur. Uh, and you, again, you have this long tail. You've got just the two legs. You've got the bat-like wings. Uh, really amazing. A dragon was killed in the wetlands near Rome in 1691. According to reports, it lived in a cave. It terrorized the local population. And once it was killed, they put it, they stuffed it, and they put it on a mount. Well, the mount's long disintegrated and been lost. But a sketch of that skeleton was made by Ignario Cornelia Meyer, and it closely resembles a tailed pterosaur, a ramphorhynchoid pterosaur. Perhaps one of the final reports, histories of a pterosaur that seems credible, actually comes from this country. There were cowboys in 1890 that were out doing what cowboys do, rounding up their cattle, I guess, and all of a sudden, a large dragon, a winged dragon, came flying overhead. Well, with your cowboy, what are you going to do? So you whip out your gun, bam, 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 they killed it. Maybe killed the last thunderbird, as the Indians called them. And it was so enormous, they couldn't even take the whole thing, so they cut off the wing, brought it back to the town of Tombstone, and the newspaper ran the story about it. Uh, possibly killing one of the last pterosaurs in this country. Okay, we've talked about uh, dinosaurs in the Bible, dinosaurs in history. Let's talk about the fossils for just a moment here. We have some interesting evidence from the fossils themselves that they just aren't millions and millions of years ago, but much more recent, and that these creatures lived alongside man. In the Paluxy River in Glen Rose, Texas, we have tracks full of dinosaur tracks in those rock layers. You see these dinosaur tracks kind of eroded out because of it's in the bottom of, of a river, in the, in the Paluxy River. And then we have what looks a little bit more like human tracks. Now, these are quite eroded from what they once were. The ancient people said that lived there said, yeah, these were very clearly human tracks. But then we have some that were actually taken out of the rocks and preserved and that are a lot more realistic. Here's the Willet track. This was found in the state park, their dinosaur state park, uh, in the uh, Glen Rose area. And then probably the most famous, this one more recently came to light, this is the Alvis Delk print, and you see a tridactyl acanthrosaurus track, and it's going across what appears to be a human footprint. This has been CT scan authenticated to show that, okay, yeah, there's compression, there's a squeezing of the matrix down below both the dinosaur track and the human track, and so it wasn't just carved out. Whoever left these footprints missed the boat, literally, right? They're fleeing something, probably Noah's flood, and then in the sediments that would later become hardened and become fossilized, uh, trace fossils, we see that there's human and dinosaur tracks together. So how old are the dinosaur bones? Well, evolution is going to say they're 65 million years, maybe as much as, you know, 100 or maybe even 150 million years for some of the early Triassic dinosaurs. But when they occasionally break open a bone, they find inside soft tissue. 
Evidence of hemoglobin, still recognizable shapes of red blood cells in unfossilized dinosaur bone is powerful testimony against the whole idea of dinosaurs living millions of years ago. My friend, soft tissue like hemoglobin, these are fragile molecules. Osteocytes, these, these bone cells. It just isn't going to last even 100,000 years. How do we know? Well, we've got the science of forensics. We know how long things last. If things deteriorate quickly, things decay. For example, think of the mummies of Egypt. Okay, now these guys are in a pristine environment, right? They're buried in these tombs. It's very dry to kind of preserve it. Oftentimes they've put in preservatives, frankincense, and different things to embalm them. And then they put them in there, and of course people go, and the, ar and the archaeologists dig them up, and they put them on display. I've been to Egypt. I've seen these, these, these pharaohs, these mummies, they're in bad shape. They're really decayed. I mean, some things like, you know, their, their structures, their bones are fine, you know, and their hair, but believe it or not, the hair is actually pretty good. But yeah, the skin, the soft tissue is just really in bad shape. And it's been, what, several thousand years. Can you imagine tens of thousands of years? There's just no way. Much less millions or 60 million. It just isn't credible. Here's pictures under a microscope of dinosaur red blood cells. Here's a T-Rex bone that was found in the Hell Creek Formation uh, by Mary Schweitzer's team, and you can still see the soft, pliable tissue in there. Soft tissue discovered by Mary Schweitzer. She states, the laws of chemistry and biology and everything else we know say it should be gone. It should be degraded completely. Well, in 2020, researchers isolated the first dinosaur DNA in a hapro Hypocarosaurus. This genetic material is very fragile. It could never last hundreds of thousands, much less millions of years. Uh, here you see the dino cells actually dividing. And over there we see some dinosaur DNA. Amazing. Amazing that this stuff is preserved. How many heard of carbon-14? Carbon-14, you hear about it in the news and radiocarbon. We'll talk about it a little bit more as we go along here. But radiocarbon is one of the most common, well-understood scientific dating mechanisms. In 2012, researchers analyzed multiple dinosaur bone samples from across the western United States. C14 revealed that they are less than 39,000 years old. I'm not saying they're even 39,000, but that's, that's kind of, they're less than 39,000. So the best C14 dating process, accelerated mass spectrometry, was used to date them. And uh, I believe all these dating methods are somewhat exaggerated, but you're, again, you're not getting 100,000. Uh, there wouldn't be any carbon-14 at all left at 100,000, uh, certainly not millions of years. Okay, we've got a few minutes left here. Let's have some fun. Let's go on a dinosaur hunting expedition or two. We have an area of research called cryptozoology. What on earth is cryptozoology? Well, if you kind of tease apart the word a little bit, crypto means hidden. Zoology is a study of animals. So it's a study of hidden animals. It's really looking for animals that have not yet been confirmed by science to exist. Maybe we've got some indigenous peoples that give reports. Maybe somebody, you know, thinks they've seen this thing. Maybe they got a hazy photo, and they're looking for it. They're trying to see if this actually exists. And we've had some wonderful breakthroughs in uh, the area of cryptozoology. For example, you see this bashful-looking little dude over here. Looks kind of like a zebra mixed with a giraffe. That's the forest giraffe. That is an okapi. And for years... The indigenous people that lived in equatorial Africa told the Western explorers about this creature, the Okapi. And they said, oh, you guys are making up stories. There's no way. This is a, this crazy half and half. And then they found the hide of one of these things. So they got serious about it. They went looking for it. They caught a baby one. Unfortunately, it died on the way out. But eventually they got some and brought him into captivity. And there is an Okapi. They're rare, but a really fascinating, amazing creature. Now, how about this little fishy fellow here on the left? We've talked about this one of our previous sessions. This is a coelacanth, remember? This was caught off the coast of South Africa near Madagascar. And uh, since then, another population has been found uh, near Indonesia. So multiple populations of these creatures have come to light. Could it be we've got some of the great reptiles out there still? Could it be that maybe we have some of the swimming plesiosaurus? Could it be that we have some of these walking dinosaurs? Could it be that we have some of these flying pterosaurs, some of the great reptilian dinosaurian creatures. I'll mention a few possible candidates. Now, we can't be dogmatic about any of these things till we actually get one. That's what allows us to give it a name as a species. But there are some reports that are fairly convincing. I'll mention a few of them here. Here is Lake Champlain, not far from where we are now. It's on the border between New York State 
and Vermont. It goes up in the top part up into Canada. Uh, but there is a creature that lives in this lake that they call Champ. And Champ uh, has been, you know, the stories of him go all the way back to the Abenaki Indians and uh, uh, the Champlain who discovered the lake. And Samuel Champlain actually brought back reports of it. But here's a, a picture from 1977 uh, that appears to show something like a plesiosaur, a long-necked swimming creature. Perhaps it even comes and goes. We know it goes into the St. Lawrence Seaway, goes out to the ocean, so maybe they come up in there to breed or to have their young. We don't know. Uh, but there have been multiple people, even some video footage from some fishermen of this creature called Champ. So possibility of a dinosaur and creature living in that glacial lake. How many heard of Loch Ness Monster? Yeah, they market that fellow really well. I'm a bit more skeptical about Loch Ness Monster. Most of the reports, most of the pictures are seriously in question. Even this, the surgeon's photo, rather dubious. There was a deathbed confession and don't know. Maybe the best evidence is these pictures, these underwater pictures taken by Dr. Robert Ryan's harem with Dr. Ryan's. Uh, and he's a foremost Nessie researcher. I was actually at Loch Ness. Here I am. When you're there, you can imagine there's some kind of a creature that lives in. It's a very foggy area, kind of black, dark water. You put your hand in way down there. You can't even see your fingers. The water is very dark from all the peat moss. It's a beautiful lake, very deep lake. Uh, I was able to go out on a boat, and the captain of the boat, the skipper there, said, yeah, we've had our sonar. We've actually had some major, large creatures swimming underneath our boat. Don't know what it is, but we think the champ's for real. I don't know. I'm not quite as sanguine on Champ. Um, maybe there's something there. Maybe there was once something there. Here's one that I think is actually a little more likely. In British Columbia, Canada, Lake Okanagan, 79 miles long, 800 feet deep. And in that lake is a creature they call Ogopogo. Isn't that a great name for a monster? Ogopogo. Well, we have lots of reports of this creature, some supposed pictures and even a videotape taken by Ken Champlin. A lot of the photos, you just see these humps coming up out of the water. You don't see a head, you don't see a tail. So here I am, we rented a boat, me and my family, we took a little vacation. It's very accessible. You can stay in a nice, you know, Airbnb or bed and breakfast or something there on the, on the edge of the lake. We rented a boat, spent multiple days going around the lake, driving it and also on a boat. And uh, we were coming around the bend of what is Ellison Provincial Park, and it was just got real quiet all of a sudden. Like the wind died down. It was just beautiful. And I kind of cut the engine. And my whole family was kind of looking. And all of a sudden, we see these humps come up out of the lake. Don't, didn't see a head or anything, just some bumps. And then start moving away from our boat at a high rate of speed and leaving a big wake. Well, we got the video camera rolling. And by the time we got it rolling, the creature had submerged. But we got a picture of this huge wake that was coming off this creature as it was uh, going away from us. What was it? I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe I saw the Ogopogo phenomenon. It certainly seemed like it. In Papua New Guinea, they talk about a creature called the Ropen, R-O-P-E-N. It flies around at night, nocturnal. It has these uh, bat-like wings, has 10, 12-foot wingspan, has long tail with a widening at the end of the tail, and has this head crest, and it has teeth in its jaws, and they, they talk about it eating fish and this type of thing. So we went there to investigate uh, 27 and a half hours one way. It's a long flight, a, a series of flights. Rented a, a, a airplane, got us out on this island called Umbo in the Siasi Island chain there in Papua New Guinea. Began to talk to people, and based on the reports, we believe it's something like this, something like a dimorphodon uh, ramphorhynchoid pterosaur. Our objective was to hike up to some of these remote mountain peaks because these are volcanic peaks at the top where there was the old volcanic caldera of these beautiful lakes. And we know the creatures aren't drinking the salt water from the ocean. We think, well, maybe they're drinking from the lake. So we had night vision, thermal imagers, and we were there to see if we couldn't maybe get a picture of this creature. And one night, I was sitting there. I was looking over the uh, edge. And between us and the next mountain, I saw what they described, a large flying creature just kind of coming by, much larger than a bat or an owl. I didn't see enough detail to tell you what it is. All I know is there's something really strange flying around there, and the guide says, that's it, that is the Ropen. Uh, since we were there, Discovery Channel went there. There's been a number of expeditions. They've gotten pictures of these things flying from a great distance. Nothing clear. I'd love to get a, a really clear, but it's difficult because it's nighttime. It's nocturnal. Um, let me wrap it up with one more, the Mokele Membe. This may be one of the likeliest, I think, out there. The Mokele Membe is something like a sauropod dinosaur. It's, it's supposed to be 
in that area there of uh, equatorial Africa. And uh, this was researched back in the 1970s by Roy Mackle, University of Chicago, and he wrote the book A Living Dinosaur. And the reports of these pygmies actually killing these creatures in the Likwala swamps there in the Congo. Well, Congo kind of descended to civil war. So it was difficult to get into the Congo. And that's where some of the best reports were coming out. In fact, here's a, a carving of a wood, a wood carving of what was supposedly a Mokele Membe uh, by these peoples there. But then around 2000, late 90s, 2000, we began to hear about reports coming from the country of Cameroon. Now you notice here's Cameroon uh, next to its Central African Republic, below its Gabon. But here is the Republic of Congo. You have this shared border between Congo and it's that area there in the southeast part of Cameroon. Some missionaries were working with the Baca pygmies and we began to hear reports of a creature they call Likile Bembe, which is pretty much similar, different dialect of Mokile and Bembe. So we... Uh, a couple of us flew into Douala and over to Yaoundé. We rented a vehicle. We went up to Bertu, which was the mission station. Then we began to go down logging roads down to Yakaduma. And then we actually began to hike and float the river down towards Malundu. So here is our guide, Pierre, and there is me and a guy named Bill Gibbons. Here we are filling up at a jungle gas station. And eventually we get into the bush and you begin to see the pygmies. Look at these poor people. They have hardly any clothing, just rags for clothing. You see the bloated little bellies from malnutrition. Here I am standing next to some of these pygmies and you can see I'm 5'9". I'm not really that tall, but much taller than them. They're very short people, but are very sturdy, hardy people. You see they have these thatched roofs and they have these uh, bark uh, walls they build in their huts. Well, we hired a number of them to be guides for us and they took most of the stuff. They were carrying these uh, long spears for protection, and they also had, you know, their knives to be able to cut down the underbrush, and they moved so quickly, we could hardly keep up with them. Amazing. These people know the forest, and they took us out into the rainforest, and, you know, of course, we're seeing all kinds of wild things. We're seeing huge trees. We're seeing prickly trees. We're slogging through swamps day after day. You get foot rot and just bugs everywhere. It's not exactly a wonderful touristy place to go on vacation. Um, but as we're going through, eventually we get through the swamps, and you can see there's a little bit of sunshine, but then it rains on you again. You put your sleeping bag up in the rain, and you're in the tent in the rain, and you're hiking in the rain. But we finally get to the area of the Bumba River. And in the Bumba River, they say, okay, right here, we have seen this creature. That's where they see the Mokele Membe. So we had brought with us, and of course, they're going on their dug it out canoes very quietly, and as soon as the creature sees them, it disappears. Well, we had brought with us an inflatable raft. Not quite a dugout canoe, but our Western version of it. And so here I am, Dino Dave, floating down the Bumba River. Now you say, well, Dino Dave, you're crazy. What about the crocodiles and the hippos? What about the Mokele Membe? We prayed a lot. We didn't even know if there were waterfalls around the next bend. Here we are going down the river. And we stopped at various villages. And you have to understand, these people had never seen outsiders. They'd never seen a strange guy with white skin. The kids would come up and try to see if they could scratch the paint off. My point is that nobody had influenced them about ideas about dinosaurs or dinosaur extinction or anything like this. And we tried to be very careful in our approach. We'd sit down with them, we'd ask them about their village, we'd ask them about different animals. We had a book. And we'd start flipping through some pictures and we'd show them creatures that they should recognize. We'd show them crocodiles. We'd show them hippos. We'd show them gorillas. And they'd give their name for us and they'd tell us about how big they are. And we'd talk to them for, you know, 20, 30 minutes about different creatures and their size and what they eat and all this stuff. And then we'd flip the page to a sauropod dinosaur. And, oh, I'm sorry. Then we'd flip the page to things that they shouldn't know. First off, polar bear, kangaroos, things like this. And they'd say, no. Next page, no, no. And then we'd flip it to the sauropod dinosaur and they'd say, yeah, Mokile Bembe. Consistently, village after villager, after village, or Likula Bembe. Uh, depending on the dialect. Here's one of the eyewitnesses who had seen these creatures. And one of the things they told us was, look for an area of the river where there's no crocodiles and no hippos. That's where you'll find the Mokele Membe. And I heard this a number of times, you know, that it drives off the crocodiles and hippos. And I, and I got to ask, and I'm like, wait a minute, this thing has a small mouth. How is it driving off the crocodiles and the hippos? It says, no, 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 no. They said it fights with the tail. That was kind of interesting to me. Well, here we are in a dugout canoe, a lot of bananas. On the other side of the river, there is the Congo. So this is kind of the bottom of the line. There's a ferry crossing. And the guy who guards the ferry here said, yeah, I saw one of these things just three months ago. It was going down the river. As soon as it saw me, it went under the water. So these things seem to be fairly reclusive, kind of bashful. They don't want to encounter humans. 
Uh, after we came back, I published a report on our research. BBC went down there. Since then, there's been some uh, French teams that have gone down there. There was a Canadian team that went. The Canadian team actually got a picture of an abandoned nest of one of these creatures. And then another team actually got some uh, footprints, and they're taking casts of footprints there, and uh, they got footprint photos, a Mokulite membrane footprint, but nobody has yet gotten a picture of the actual creature. So we're hoping to go back to Cameroon again in about a year. Uh, we aim to do it with electric motors, which will be a lot quieter than some of these teams that are going around with gas-powered engines and just scaring everything before they ever get to it. i got to wrap things up. But I want to conclude by just quickly talking about the accuracy of the Bible. This story I heard about the tale of the Mokele Membe was very fascinating to me. And I came back, and in my Bible reading, I just happened to be reading in the book of the Revelation. In Revelation chapter 12, it talks about this great red dragon. And it's a picture of Satan and Satan's rebellion against God. And it says this in verses 3 and 4 and verse 9. It says, His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Well, the stars of heaven, of course, the angels. And so a third of the angels got pulled along with Satan in his rebellion against God. But very interesting, no, notice what the offensive weapon of the dragon is. The tail. Remember what Job says? He moves his tail like a cedar tree, like a big club. Wham! Wham! The pygmies say that when they swing the tail, they can actually make a snap at the end, like wham, like a, a sonic boom from the snapping of the tail. I began to study this matter of the dragon's tail. And in a book called The Aberdeen Bestiary, an old book from the Library of Henry VIII, written in the 1500s, talks about the dragon. It says this, quote, Its strength lies not in its teeth, but in its tail. It kills with a blow rather than a bite. And then I began reading modern paleontologists, and multiple paleontologists have surmised that these creatures fought with their tails. Here's a quote from uh, 2014. The tail bones are gargantuan with huge muscle scars that show us it essentially had weaponized a tail that was 30 feet long. The diplodocids could actually snap them like a bullwhip and make a snapping noise, we believe. Now, my friends, how did the pygmies know this? if they didn't actually encounter it? How in the medieval, in the Middle Ages, how did they know it if they didn't actually encounter dragons? And of course, the Bible, long before any of them. Here's my point. If you just believe the Bible, you'll be ahead of the scientists. Why? It's God's Word, and we can trust it. Oh, the evolutionists say, well, we think this happened, we think that happened. They weren't there. Nobody was there to say, yeah, this was 65 million years ago. Let's put that sign there next to that trice. No, no, no. They're just guessing. God was there. And he tells us exactly what he did and what happened. And we can trust God's word. Well, I have lots more on evidence that men and dinosaurs coexisted at genesispark.com. Feel free to go out. You can leave me a note there. Dino Dave responds to all emails. But I hope you can understand what we like to say, dinosaurs are living evidence of a powerful creator.